Horror movie posters have a varied history, from the gothic theatricality of the early years, through the florid desperation of B-movies, to the starker, more minimalist designs favoured today. This isn't a list of the greatest horror movie posters, it's just 25 which are, for whatever reason, great, interesting, amusing, or weird. Posters of good and bad movies alike which demonstrate and celebrate that variety. You can't ignore the visual cleverness of the Halloween poster. At first, it just appears to be a knife re-echoed in after images which recall the repeated slashes of Hitchcock's Psycho. Only then do you notice that these blades form a pumpkin, malevolent eyes burning from it. There are two other things worth noting about this poster. Firstly, that disembodied hand isn't just holding the knife. Look at the veins standing out. He's gripping it as tightly as he can, adding to the implied frenzy of the image. The other thing to note about this poster is its anonymity. No name, no face, nothing but a hand. Who is gripping that knife? Who is the emphasised he of the tagline? We know when we'll find out. There aren't many producers who double up as production designer, but Albin Grau was a remarkable producer, although not a very successful one since the only film he produced ended up victim of a lawsuit from the Stoker family owing to its strange similarity to Dracula. An occultist as well as an artist and architect, Grau designed a whole range of posters for the movie which are actually much more expressionist than the film itself. This is our favourite because Look at it! It's pure atmosphere. How could you not want to see this? And why the hell don't we get posters like this anymore? It doesn't say one single specific thing about the film and yet sums up the sense of it completely. It's perfect. I would have this on my bedroom wall, except I'd never sleep again. There are very few films in which Ray Harryhausen's animation is upstaged by anything. But, based on the poster for One Million Years BC, the producers knew exactly what the selling point was. Now, on the face of it, this seems a pretty pervy choice and that would be hard to deny, except for one thing. B-movie posters are full of hot, semi-nude women, but this is the iconic one. The fur bikini is certainly helping, but I think what sets it apart is that there's a story being told. Miss Welch isn't standing looking pretty. Her pose suggests she's ready to run. There's an anxiety about her. And why not? Look behind her, as so few people choose to do. She's framed against a sea of chaos. Fire, dinosaurs, cavemen. But she towers over all of it because it's her story. This may be a film about a sexy woman wearing not very much, but she has a definite role in it. That's unlikely to put this film on any list of feminist movies, but it does matter. Night of the Lepus doesn't have the best poster on this list, and it's certainly not the best movie. So why does it make the cut? Because it's hilarious, and because it fulfills a different function to every other poster that we've chosen. This isn't trying to trumpet a film's strong points, tell us what it's about, or even hint at the subject matter to tease us into seeing the movie. Look at it. How many eyes does horror have? How many times will terror strike? They were born in that tragic moment when science made its great mistake. Now, from behind the shroud of night they come, a scuttling, shambling horde of creatures destroying all in their path. And any resemblance to a film about giant bunny rabbits is entirely coincidental. From the Latin of the title, to the ridiculously obscure image, to the text, every bit of this poster is about hiding what the movie is about until you've bought your ticket. And it's too late. And you're just left sitting there in the dark going, giant rabbits? Some movie posters are a tease. This one is a con. Most movies 
don't like to include specific scenes from the film on the poster, and certainly not key moments. Partly because you run the risk of giving away the plot, but also because marketing is supposed to be general, aiming at mass appeal by throwing lots of stuff at you. The Poltergeist poster ignores all this conventional wisdom with a stark, simple poster showing the film's most memorable moment. And it works because that moment is a tease that in itself tells you nothing. They're here. Who are they? What do they want? What has the TV got to do with anything? Far from giving away the plot, this just raises more questions. You walk away feeling like you know less about the movie than you did before, and you have to know more. They're here. Plus, little girls are creepy. There, I've said it. You don't have to be a great film to have a great poster. And in this case, you don't even have to be a watchable one. Anybody who paid money to see Werewolves on Wheels did so because of the title and the poster which is everything the film should have been and so spectacularly wasn't. It's a riot of activity. You can spend ages looking at it, picking out the details. The werewolf with an arcane symbol around his neck, riding his hog over a corpse. The half-naked girl holding a skull and with a giant snake between her legs, suggesting nothing, I'm sure. In the background, there's a biker with a burning torch and a satanic ritual overlooked by a vulture. Above all, this poster has an animation to it, like it's going to leap off the wall, and it's advertising a movie so dreary, so lacking in anything remotely resembling activity, that you genuinely would be better off staring at the poster for 90 minutes. There are a lot of ways in which a poster can grab the attention of a potential audience, but the one for the abominable Dr. Fives does so by being completely unexpected. The central image, rendered in black and white and colour, suggests a gothic horror, as does the title. And even if there is an element of comedy as well, you expect a poster that reflects that, like Roger Corman's The Raven. Instead, the poster is bright, the yellow background making it seem almost sunny. The Art Deco surround places it in a theatrical context, Dr. Fives is an organist, and there are bouquets of flowers at its base. This looks like an old-fashioned 1940s romance, especially that improbable central couple. A twisted romance, then, underlined by that brilliant tagline, love means never having to say you're ugly. I don't think the poster for Dr. Fives tells you what the movie's about. I think it goes one better. It tells you that whatever you think the movie is about, you're probably wrong. Designed by Tom Hodges of The Dude Designs, Hobo with a Shotgun was the poster that managed to out-grindhouse Grindhouse. It reeks of authenticity, from its stains to its creases, to the extent that you can hardly believe this was only made six years ago. It leaps off the page and tells you immediately what this movie should be about. The impact the poster had, far more than the impact of the film, to be honest, is made all the more because it feels like an antidote to every glossy, mass-produced, airbrushed, anodyne, cookie-cutter movie poster produced by mainstream Hollywood. If the last Avengers film had had a poster like this, I might have gone to see it. There's a lot of different reasons that we selected the different posters on this list, because there's a lot of different things that can make a poster great, but some of them are just straight up awesome. Of course, it has Bela Lugosi and Boris Karloff on it, and note that Karloff just needed a surname while Lugosi needed Bella as well. There's a slap in the face. But look at how little is actually drawn. Only the unconscious girl in the middle is fully represented. Everyone else is disembodied heads and hands, and yet you seem to see the whole of their bodies in the dark body of the cat that looms over everything else. The highlighted cat's eyes are also significant, more so in Poe's original story. And it's not just me who loves this poster. An original copy sold for $286,800 in 2007. Does it have anything to do with the movie? Not really. But when someone comes up with an image this good, you've got to go with it. And in this case, those people were Salvador Dali and Philippe Halsman, whose Involuptas Mors, or Involuptuous Death, was the basis for this poster. And when I say basis, I mean they put clothes on the girls and tweaked the lighting. So, not exactly original, 
tells you sod all about the film, but who cares when it looks this good? Some posters, it's easy to make a lot of obvious comments about. That for A Tale of Two Sisters is stark, beautifully composed and very disturbing, appealing to its target market and no one else. What gets said less often is how well it references its own title. Look at the relative positions of the girls. One upright, meeting our gaze, her shoulders held by a protective mother. The other slumped, ignored, perhaps even dead. And yet her hand is held by her sibling. What points are being made here? What subtle inferences should we draw from them? Whatever the tale of these two sisters proves to be, it begins here, on the poster. On the face of it, there's nothing very special about the poster for William Castle's House on Haunted Hill. Not that it's a bad poster. It has a fabulous image and Vincent Price holding a severed head on one side and someone drowning or dissolving in an acid bath on the other. What's not to like? It's just nothing amazing of its type. The reason we're including it is that, intentionally or unintentionally, and given William Castle's sense of humour, I think there's a good chance it's intentional, the central image is a great in-joke. The film's most famous scene involves a skeleton suspended on wires. Come with me, murderess. Come with me. The poster neatly turns the tables, with the skeleton doing the suspending. Gotta love that. This one needs no introduction. The image was painted by artist Roger Castell for the cover of Peter Benchley's book, but it was so powerful that, in a very rare move, the filmmakers asked for permission to use it, and the publishers, Bantam, let them have it free of charge. Steven Spielberg famously said that John Williams' music gave him the shark he couldn't afford, but the image of that shark was already subliminally placed in the audience's mind by the poster. The key thing about the poster is the water. So much of the film hangs on Bodhi's fear of the water, and there it is, covering almost the whole sheet. The girl on top is completely oblivious to what's about to hit her. And that's the point. You never know what lurks beneath the surface. The poster has identified the key fear on which the film plays. So when you go in and you see that opening scene, you're already scared for the girl. It may be the answer to the question, what is the dumbest thing we could possibly call a horror movie? It may also be the answer to the question, what is the least convincing animal ever to be made threatening by a horror movie? But check out the poster, clearly designed by someone who saw the movie and decided to take it way less seriously than it takes itself. Firstly, you've got to admire the way it sums up the man versus nature thing in one indisputable image. Secondly, you've got to admire the way it completely misleads you into thinking this is about giant frogs. Which it really isn't, but once frogs are attacking, who cares about such minor details as scale? But more importantly, and I know we're supposed to be focusing on the image, check out the finest tagline ever to completely undermine a movie's credibility. Today the pond, tomorrow the world. I wonder how many people went to see this film thinking it was a comedy. It's a contentious subject, but in my opinion, which is the only one that matters here, Bram Stoker's Dracula is not the finest version of that oft-filmed novel, and the Universal and Hammer posters for their films are better as standalone images. What puts Bram Stoker's Dracula on this list is that it is very clever. An incomplete image with a single word and not even a hint of what film this is, who was in it, or even what studio it came from. It's a poster that very specifically doesn't advertise the film. It builds suspense for the next poster. We're so used to seeing movie posters around us that we just walk past them. This one, you don't walk past. You stop and look at it and then you're on the lookout for the next poster. That's good marketing. The Evil Dead's poster certainly speaks to its content, immediately establishing that this is about a person trying to escape. But more than that, it seems to be about the film itself. The Evil Dead burst onto the scene seemingly from nowhere, adored by some, reviled by others, but impossible to ignore. It, well, it grabbed people by the throat. 
other film posters fill up the space with stars and other stuff, trying to drag in as many people as possible. Maybe you don't like this, but you'll love this. The Evil Dead goes for one uncompromising image, as if to say, this is our movie. If you don't like this, don't bother watching. That's ballsy. And that's The Evil Dead. Designed by artist Matthew Peake, this is a poster that succeeds both on the big and the small scale. The immediate impact is obvious, but the closer you look, the more you see. The light flare draws your eyes to the blades, but is also suggestive of the supernatural. The bars at the top, one of which actually passes through Freddy's head, are clearly part of the bed, but also suggest being trapped. The girl's hand holding the blankets across her is defensive both of her life and her nudity. The staring eyes are of someone too scared to sleep and are a repetition of Freddy's eyes above. It's an iconic poster for an iconic movie and features our first glimpse of a soon-to-be iconic character. Not everything on this list has to be classic or trash. There's room for the average too. April Fool's Day isn't making anybody's top 10 list, but damn, that's a fine poster. It's not particularly eye-catching, doesn't force on you a hard sell or throw stars in your face. It's just clever, which is an underrated and frankly pretty rare quality in poster design. The knife is easy and obvious, but the hair noose is a stroke of genius. But what I love most about the poster is two things. Firstly, with two murder methods front and centre, I really wonder what's in that glass. Secondly, Look at those people in the background. What a bunch of jackasses. I can't wait for them to die. There were lots of cool posters for The Shining, but this is arguably the most striking, managing to combine the gothic and the minimalist. The front of the hotel recalls the lift doors in the movie, filled with blood which is pouring through the maze to reach the unsuspecting figures waiting to enter. Meanwhile, Art Deco lights suggest eyes staring out at us, reinforcing the idea that the Overlook itself is the monster in this. It is stark yet gory, symbolist yet obvious, clear yet suggestive of a mysterious tangle of events that may in the end lead nowhere at all. Movies are journeys we embark upon. This poster is inviting us in, but simultaneously warning us. Bottom line, Movie posters are about marketing, and marketing means shoving a film's selling points in the audience's face. Karloff, Price, Laure, and Edgar Allan Poe. That's a killer combination. There's even a quote from Poe on the poster in the space usually reserved for critics. And once you've been hit in the face by that, down at the bottom of the poster, there's all this going on. Torture, skeletons, axes, fire. The diagonal slant of the action draws your eye to this pretty girl in attractive disarray. There's activity. This is a fast-paced film in which stuff happens. And colour. It's bright and vivid. The Raven isn't a grim, dark horror film. It's a fun one. How can you not want to see this? The poster for The Last Exorcism is far from a classic. It has little in the way of atmosphere and still less mystery or subtlety. It's on this list because it is interesting and because it was successful. There's no image manipulation here, nor was there in any of the contortions throughout the film. Actress Ashley Bell has a condition called hypermobility, making her joints very loose and flexible. It was this ability that suggested the poster, arresting, grotesque, and a chaotic contrast to the stark, quiet crucifix above. It makes for an eye-catching poster, and it certainly caught some eyes in the UK where it was banned from public display. Something that almost certainly helped sell the film better than seeing the poster ever would have. If you're looking for a clear difference between classic and modern horror movie posters, then it's that the modern ones tend to favour a less is more approach, as exemplified by Alien. It borders on the minimalist, focusing on the ominous egg with that troubling green light and smoke coming out of the crack. What's great about this poster is that it stays with you when you watch the film. So when John Hurt leans over the egg, you find yourself shouting at the screen, Don't do it, John! I saw it on the poster! It's got all that green shit inside! 
In addition, the lack of much else going on directs you towards what has to be one of the most effective movie taglines of all time. In space, no one can hear you scream. I Walked With a Zombie is a film that needed a great poster to make up for the tremendous negative drag of a title forced on producer Val Luton by RKO executives. The film is far better than the title suggests, but what the poster really does is intrigue. It is a symphony of blues and yellows, creating a nocturnal atmosphere. But in the middle of it is one green eye, the owner of which is reaching out to us, drawing us in. The hand itself has a hint of puppetry, making us think that it's responsible for the girl on the left in a trance and the man on the right screaming. We have to do as it says, and what it's saying is, ignore the title, ignore the fact that the word zombie is written in silly squiggly lines. See this film, you will be scared. And our penultimate offering is a poster too massive to be contained by the unholy attics of DCHQ. Arguably the greatest movie poster of all time and certainly one of the best known. What is it that makes this stand out from all of its B-movie brother and sister? Obviously from a more artistic standpoint is the limited colour palette. The white bikini seems stark against the yellow sky, only a shade brighter than the woman's skin, while her hair is a vivid orange. These colours are then repeated in the film's title. The other thing that makes it stand out is the image of a semi-clothed woman, always popular, but this has something else. It's a semi-clothed woman who could crush you like a bug. Why this should appeal to men, who can say, but it really does. Horror is filled with iconic images. Every generation has their favourite. But few have entered the public and cultural consciousness to the extent of this image from The Exorcist. Its composition suggests classic horror. There is almost a universal feel to its art direction, but in service to a fiercely modern film. The Exorcist and Poltergeist are the only films on our list to use actual images from the film as their posters, and they both take a similar approach, not using an image of the horror, but of the moment before. The Exorcist gives us an image of calm before a storm, an image of tension, an image that, while innocent in itself, carries a heavy weight of foreboding. It's also an image of light being brought into darkness. Symbolism, anyone? Thanks for watching. Like we said, this isn't a definitive list, so feel free to chip in with any personal favorites, glaring omissions, and hopefully a few oddities we haven't even heard of in the comments below. Subscribe for more specials and weekly reviews, or if you'd like to help us more by supporting us on Patreon, click here.